started last season when the NFL scriptwriters and I decided. Uh, Arian was telling me about how the NFL is rigged and how every year he used to get a script. Yeah. Day one of training camp that would get dropped off at his locker. Mm -hmm. did, did you memorize those before the season started or would you go and rehearse the script before every game? Uh, we were really dedicated to it, so it was more so like um, that's what practice was about. What? What the f The NFL is scripted. If you don't believe me, look back at its history. Storybook endings, overcoming tremendous obstacles, unnecessary drama. The evidence is all here. Stop being so naive. Let's take a look at the NFL's most scripted moments. Tim Tebow versus the Steelers. If you're a believer in numerology or maybe just a believer in the general sense, the script writers penned a great one for you. In 2011, the Broncos caught fire in the middle of the season, switching out Kyle Orton for second year Tim Tebow, the outspoken Christian quarterback whose unorthodox throwing motion and unparalleled determination made him a Heisman winner and national champion. His throwing motion also made you believe there was some type of CGI happening to make his ball seem catchable. After an eight and five start where the Broncos benefited from timely plays like booming field goals from Matt Prater and successful onside kicks, the Broncos stumbled down the stretch, losing their last three games and barely eking out an AFC West title in a perfectly mediocre division. Enter the Pittsburgh Steelers, led by a godless, Philistine-esque quarterback and a fearsome defense that allowed the fewest total points and fewest passing yards in the NFL. It was apparent from the opening kick that this would be a game of surreal, movie-like coincidences. The fearsome Steelers defense put eight men in the box and said, beat us. After a couple long connections with Demarius Thomas, it was abundantly clear that Tebow was doing just that. The Steelers were able to tie the game before the end of regulation, and this wild card matchup drifted into overtime. But not for long. On the first play of OT, Tebow fired a strike to Thomas, and one stiff arm later, the game was over. In storybook fashion, Tebow's unlikely upset of the Steelers might have been enough to convert some non-believers, but the scriptwriters tossed in some numerology that appealed to a wider Christian audience. In college, Tebow wrote John 3.16 on his eye black, a reference to a Bible verse from the book. Look, you know the verse, probably. Tebow's final stat line in the wild card game, 316 passing yards and 31.6 yards per completion. Not to mention CBS's ratings for the game were 31.6 and the Steelers possessed the ball for 31 minutes and six seconds. Is that a little too ham-fisted from the writers? A little on the nose? Probably not for the crowd that asked for the sequel, God's Not Dead 2, God's Revenge. This was, of course, what the writers came up with following the 2011 lockout, which was actually a writer strike in disguise. Jerome Bettis Super Bowl win in Detroit. This time the Riders helped the gold and black out. The Steelers, following a 15-1 season that ended in the AFC Championship, were a mere wildcard entry in the 2005 postseason. But before the season, 33-year-old running back Jerome Bettis mulled retirement, but was enticed into one last ride thanks to a promise from Ben Roethlisberger that he would take the bus to a Super Bowl. It probably went like some scene from Necessary Roughness. As luck would have it, Super Bowl 40 was set in Detroit, Michigan, Bettis's hometown. This took particular forethought from the writers who had to coordinate the Super Bowl bid with Bettis's retirement, but of course, they made it work. The Steelers would have to win three road games to get to Detroit and surprise, surprise, they were able to do that. The road to Motown began in Cincinnati where Kimo Von Ollenhofen took out Carson Palmer's knee on the very first drive of the game. Apparently the writers didn't tell Palmer this and he was pretty pissed. A week later, the script called for some more tension when Bettis fumbled at the goal line, prompting Big Ben to make a game-saving tackle on Colts defensive back Nick Harper. Indy nearly came back, but the writers added in another plot twist with the idiot kicker Mike Vanderjack shanking a field goal at the buzzer and the bus was headed to Denver for the AFC title game. Denver was the setting, of course, because it's the same city linebacker Joey Porter was shot in the ass in 2003. They shot me in Denver. You know! Man, what a great line by the writers. Pittsburgh took care of Denver at mile high, bullying Jake Plummer so hard that he turned to mushrooms in order to cope with the trauma. Then came Detroit. Against the Seahawks in his hometown, Bettis only rushed for 43 yards because the writers wanted to keep things more on the realistic side, but did make sure the refs called the worst game of their life, establishing a clear antagonist for Seahawks fans. The bus rode off into the sunset, that beautiful Motor City sunset with the abandoned factories digitally removed. Giant 
Giants stopping the Patriots, 18 and 0. The 2007 New England Patriots were a villainous juggernaut like we'd never seen before. After the writers wrote Randy Moss out of Oakland, he joined Tom Brady and Wes Welker to form a dominant attack that torched and embarrassed opponents. Enter the wild card Giants. Leading man Eli Manning didn't have the movie star good looks of Tom Brady, but he did have the script on his side in Super Bowl 42. You know, it's kind of like casting Pedro Pascal as the Mandalorian. You know, once you see him, it works. So why would the script writers choose to have the underdog giants upset the mighty Patriots? Wouldn't it make sense to finally shut up Mercury Morris and the 1972 Dolphins? Nah, the moral of the story is that cheaters never prosper. The Spygate storyline established a clear antagonist during the 2007 season, and after public opinion swayed, the writer's room decided they must be stopped. So who was the real hero of the story? In one way, it was Eli Manning, but it was a wide receiver by the name of David Tyree, plucked straight out of central casting that would make the most iconic play of Super Bowl 42. Plaxo Goburras, who got an early look at the script and leaked the outcome, We're only gonna score 17 points? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Caught the game-winning touchdown, though he was disappointed to read that he'd have to shoot himself in the leg a season later. Hi, I'm Plaxico Burris. Don't mess with handguns, because accidents do happen. When they Mans does his own stunts, though. I gotta respect that. Eli toppled Brady, Tyree posted up Rodney Harrison, of course, Michael Strahan got to end his NFL arc before he was written off and joined Good Morning America, something he demanded would be written into the script before he came back. Also, hair and makeup won an Emmy for Tom Coughlin in the NFC Championship game. The power adage slash Ray Lewis's last game. Ray Lewis is one of the most complicated characters that the writers could have ever conceived of. A star linebacker, a Super Bowl MVP, a devout believer, and oh yeah, that white suit he mysteriously had to get rid of. An idea that drew clear inspiration from the HBO dramas like The Sopranos and The Wire. But it would take a fairly unrealistic plotline to get Ray Lewis a Super Bowl victory in his final game. Joe Flacco had to suddenly turn into 1989 Joe Montana during the playoffs. Raheem Moore had to jump about five minutes early, allowing a last second touchdown pass to Jacoby Jones and the most ludicrous of all, the power outage. In the battle of Harbaugh versus Harbaugh, another plot wrinkle, the Ravens jumped out to a commanding lead at the Superdome in Super Bowl 47. The tension was fading away, the viewers were beginning to tune out, and the writers had to think of something quick. Out of ideas, they decided to invoke Duke's Ex Machina and throw a couple circuit breakers, taking out some of the lights in the Big Easy and giving the 49ers time to recoup and get themselves back into the game. After getting a script revision during the timeout, the 49ers leaned on their stars, Crabtree, Gore, and Cap Kaepernick, who all scored, turning the game on its axis and shifting the Super Bowl from a blowout to a nail-biter. Fans all across the world were glued to their TVs, and not just for Beyonce. But despite the valiant comeback, the ending was set in stone. Ray Lewis had to get his, and Colin Kaepernick was made to overthrow a bizarre fade route to Michael Crabtree on fourth and goal, sealing the game for Baltimore. It was too much for Ray Lewis to win Super Bowl MVP, so Joe Flacco was given those honors and the writers were given a cut of his six-year $120 million contract. And finally, the greatest, most easily scripted shit ever. The Fail Mary was scripted to get the refs back to work. It was going to take a masterful stroke of the pen to get the NFL out of one of its greatest pickles ever. When the refs went on strike at the start of the 2012 season, something unbelievable would have to take place to establish that the regular officials, as hated as they were, were indispensable members of the NFL cast. And it would also take something crazy in front of a national audience. Enter a rookie quarterback by the name of Russell Wilson, just beginning his underdog arc, a full decade before he would become public enemy number one in Denver. It was a tight contest between the Packers and Seahawks in Seattle. Down to their last play, the elusive Wilson broke contain and heaved up a prayer to the end zone for Golden Tate. The pass was almost clearly picked off, but the replacement refs were told to take one for the team. And and being grateful just to be there, they obliged. One ref signaled touchdown, the other signaled for an interception. Ultimately, they decided it was a touchdown in a moment that caused many viewers in the Wisconsin market to turn their TV screens into Swiss cheese. The writers penned a beautiful plot twist that would force the league to ease up on their hardball negotiations with the officials restoring order to the NFL. Dang, they did their boys a solid. Those writers really do get our asses every season. Brilliant job. 
bastards. Well, I hope you enjoyed this film. I'm Five Points Vids, and you made it to my next video. What did you think when you got the script in 2016 that said your career was going to fall off a cliff when you stopped believing in God? That was 2015.